Hello, and welcome to our pre-recorded Bible study for June 5th, 2022. Uh, today we're talking about the question that defined the 4th century, are Jesus and the Holy Spirit divine? And to start off with, we'll do the prayer for the day for, uh, for one of the main characters, one of the main historical figures we'll be talking about today, uh, Emperor Constantine and his mother Helena. Almighty God, through your servant Constantine, your church flourished, and by his mother Helena, the church in the, of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem became a holy place for many pilgrims. Grant to us the same zeal for your church and charity toward your people, that we may be fruitful in good works and steadfast in faith. Keep us ever grateful for your abundant provision, with our eyes fixed as Helena's were, on the highest and greatest treasure of all, the cross of Christ. Amen. All right, and so the main question of the fourth century is dealing with uh, this idea, the, the idea of the Trinity, uh, and especially then how Jesus and the Holy Spirit are divine, and how they relate to each other, and how they relate to the, God the Father. And the reason that this becomes the big question of the fourth century is because of this, uh, because of this guy, Emperor Constantine. So he's born in about uh, 274 uh, AD, uh, died 337 AD, and was Roman emperor for 31 years uh, from 306 to 337. Uh, in 312, on the eve of a battle against his rival in Italy, uh, Maxentius, Constantine is reported to have dreamed that Christ appeared to him and told him to inscribe the holy sign XP, the first two letters of the Greek word Christos, so on the shields of his troops. So there's actually, we say, I said XP, not experience points, it's uh, the X is the Greek letter Chi, and the P is the Greek letter R. So Chi, Rho, again, the first letters in Christ, or Christos. Uh, next day he saw a cross imposed, superimposed on the sun, and then the wor in the words, by the sign you will be the victor, so in hoc signo vincis, by his sign he will conquer, something like that. Uh, then Constantine defeated him. The Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge near Rome, and the Senate hailed the victor as the savior of the Roman people. So Constantine defeats his rival. Uh, but he does so, again, with this idea that he, Christ appeared to him and that he put signs of, um, put letters Cairo and, put, and saw a cross. Uh, and then, so then through the Edict of Milan, which was uh, issued the next year, in 313, persecutions of Christians ended. It mandated the t toleration of Christians. And so, and so what this means is that it, then instead of in the first few centuries where you had periods of persecutions and, uh, and Christians had the, some rights but not fully protected rights in some areas where they were... Um, were, had better connections, better uh, relationships with authorities than others. Uh, it was really piecemeal. But now with Constantine as emperor, uh, the, then doing this, then Christianity has more of a chance to kind of come out of the shadows, out of the catacombs, out of the basement, and uh, be able to start talking with one another in a more formal way. Uh, and so as, as a result of that then, Constantine calls the Council of Nicaea in 325 to unite the churches and uh, to unite the church and 300 bishops gathered mostly from the east and mostly Greek speak. So that means they're mostly Greek speaking still. Um, so the Pope, the Pope in Rome is old but sends representatives. Um, and so they gather in Nicaea, uh, sorry Matt's a little blurry, but so it's just, just outside of Constantinople, uh, which would have been Byzantium at that time. Um, and is now Istanbul, not Constantinople. Uh, but, and so it, it was the eastern capital of the, the Roman Empire, uh, and Constantine kind of split his time between, uh, between Rome and Byzantium, um, em whose emperor gets kind of complicated from here on out because you've got different people in charge of different parts of the Roman, Roman Empire working together, sort of, for the most part. But, um, but in any case, so... Uh, Constantine, in order to try and then unite the empire, knows that there's all these Christians who are around and that it's gone from persecuted to tolerated. But there's some issues going on, and so he needs them to figure it out so there can just be 
one Christian church they can go along with one Roman Empire and then everything will be uh, better off that way all right so again it's called in 325 uh, he tries to get these different groups to agree and the main disagreement that they deal with in Nicaea deals with this guy named Arius uh, he's Arius is an elder in Alexandria Egypt uh, he lives from about 256 to 336 AD and he's communic excommunicated, so he's expelled from the church by, by his bishop Alexander for, his, for what he's teaching. Um, but then the controversy spreads beyond just Alexander, and so it's, it's um, less than that. He had, a, he had a famous, Arius had a famous teacher. Uh, there were some fellow students with him who were, um, or at least uh, kind of along, open to what he was saying, if not full-blown, uh, Arians, so to speak, um, and so the and the big controversy about Arius that Arius brings up is and for the heresy uh, that still bears his name uh, deals with is who's who Jesus is, especially who Jesus is in terms of his divinity and how he how he existed, and so Arius's theology summarized again. This is kind of the real brief overview. Uh, but that God is one and indivisible. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the Son, Jesus, is a creature, though a perfect creature. And so this is obviously where we get into issue, and we'll find out uh, some, in the next, next week or two, uh, the controversy will be how Jesus' human and divine nature work together. We're not there yet. We're just still on defi defining his divine nature. Uh, so, and then the Son... Arius also then says the sun was created outside of time and before anything else was created and the sun was not truly God. Um, so this is what, and the sun, of course, Jesus. So he's, this, this is what Arius is, is saying then that Jesus is the first, first of creation. He's created before anything else is. Uh, and so he's still super important, still super special, but not fully divine, not truly God. Um, and this, of course, gets him into into some hot water. But the problem is, of course, he's got some some Bible passages he he's able to cite and use in order to prove his point. Uh, one of which here in, in Mark 10. So as Jesus is setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, "Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life?" And Jesus said to him, "Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone." So Arius would say, "Well, this is obviously Jesus denying that he is God." Because he's saying he's not good. Why are you calling me good? I'm not good. Well, he doesn't quite doesn't really say that. He says no one is good except God alone. Um, and so, you know, we interpret that, that he's just kind of correcting this guy who doesn't quite know what he's talking about. Um, but we wouldn't see this as Jesus denying his divinity. But this is what Arius is, uh, this is what Arius is uh, implying here. Uh, in John 14, 28, um, in fact, uh, this is from the gospel lesson for today. Uh, Jesus said, you heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have, re would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Again, why would Jesus say the Father is greater than him if he's equal to the Father in terms of divinity? He's saying he, the Father is greater than he is. So what's wrong with that? Uh, and then uh, we've been going through Proverbs with the with the men's study on Thursday afternoons. And uh, we looked at this a while back, and, and this both kind of proves and disproves the divinity of Christ. Um, but this is and this is uh, wisdom talking, uh, which wisdom is uh, feminine in in Hebrew. The the word is feminine in Hebrew, and so it's lady wisdom uh, talking. But we the church has said this is. This is talking about Jesus, as, and as we go through, we'll see see why. Um, but so the Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old. Again, this is where part of where Arius gets that idea. He's the first creature, but not uncreated. Uh, ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth before he had made the earth with its fields or the first of the dust of the world. When he established the heavens, I was there. When he drew a, face, a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, 
when he assigned the, to the sea its limits, so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, that I was beside him like a master craftsman, and I daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world, and delighting in the children of man. Uh, and so again, the master workman, the craftsman at his side, as God's creating everything, which, you know, we'll, we see, well, of course, God, Jesus was present at creation. God speaks and things happen. The Word of God is present there. All, all three persons of the Trinity, you know, would have been are, are divine. They're all at work in in creation. Uh, and so we, that's how we'd argue it. But uh, Arius is saying, well, no, this isn't. And again, the church hasn't had a chance to come together and discuss these things, um, you know, freely. They've because because of persecutions, and so. Uh, this is the chance to kind of try and solve all this stuff. Um, but then the other challenge is that with Arius is that he's, um, you know, like we've talked about some with Luther later, uh, you know, centuries later, that part of why Luther's able to escape what's go what happens to other heretics at the Catholic Church burns is that he is able he's using able to use the printing press and able to get his ideas out to the common people so it's not just some ivory tower debate. Uh, and it, it said that, you know, the people in, Ari uh, in Alexandria in Arius' time were able to, having arguments about Jesus' divinity in the marketplace and, and things. And part of it is because Arius communicated those ideas through song, which of course makes things easier to remember, easier to communicate, catchier, things like that. Uh, we have an example of the song. Um, I imagine it's catchier in the original, um, and we don't know, obviously don't know the tune. Um, but this is how it translated, how, how the song would go. So he who, he who is without beginning, so Father, made the Son a beginning of created things. He produced him as a Son for himself by begetting him. He, the Son, has none of the distinct characteristics of God's own being. Uh, that's going to be an important Greek word coming up, hypostasis. For he is not equal to, nor is he of the same being as him. And that's another Greek, Greek word we'll talk about that is, um, so hypostasis and homoousius are going to be the be a couple Greek words we'll deal with as, uh, as we get, keep going. Um, so there is a triad not in equal glory. So he's, he's, he's acknowledging there's a trinity, but not that the persons are equal. Uh, their beings, their hypostasis are not mixed together among themselves. As far as their glory is one infinitely more glorious than the other, the Father in his essence, in his Uzia, is a foreigner to the Son because he exists without beginning. And this is just an excerpt, but you kind of get the idea. And again, it was probably catchier in, uh, in the original Greek. Um, but so Arius is able to communicate these ideas in song. The common people are able to, are understanding this. There's, there's fighting in the streets of Alexandria over this idea. And so Constantine trying to unite the Roman Empire and unite it around a common religion try, it brought all these the Christians together to hammer this idea out at the Council of Nicaea. Now, of course, I've, I've been referring to Arius as a heretic. Um, you know, I've been talking about some of his ideas and how they don't relate, to, don't, they aren't what we believe today. So, um, so Arius loses. Uh, obviously, uh, we, and you know some depictions of this are there. So here's Constantine, and here's all the bishops gathered for the for the council, and there's Arius um, at at the feet of everyone in the dark. He doesn't have the halo anymore. Um, so kind of a depiction there um, that the council ends up deciding against against Arius. Um, the fun side note is that one of the bishops there allegedly is Saint Nicholas of Myra, of Myra, uh, and he's infamous for allegedly slapping Arius during the council. So that's why you get a bunch of fun memes during uh, December um, of Saint Nick. So who, of course, we know as Santa Claus, um, you know, slapping Arius or punching him. Uh, and so 
the big difference then that they de that they decide on as they're discussing the Council of Nicaea is that there's one letter difference, one letter difference in Greek that changes the meaning of the word and determines is of if Jesus is of the same substance or of similar substance to the Father. And so we see here, uh, so homo usius or homoi usius. So, and of course, since he doesn't know the difference between those two words, he's not the real Saint Nicholas, uh, who was would have been at the Council of Nicaea and done this. So, um, so the homo usius group. So again, of course, you know that that prefix homo is in the in the in our culture for for different reasons, uh, but it, it means same. Um, you know, so that's why we talk about. You know, homosexuals are people attracted to the same same sex, um, you know, um, that kind of thing. Um, but so the but the homo usius groups, and so usius means kind of substance. Uh, so same substance. Uh, they, they group believe Christ is of the same substance as the Father. So God the Father and Jesus are made of the same stuff, and therefore they're both divine. Homo usians believe Christ is of a similar substance to the Father. So he's similar but not the same. So he is on a slightly lower level. Again, he's the first first creature. He's super special, but he's not divine. He's not on the same level as the as the as the Father. Um, and so those those are the two main groups. Uh, but then the you've got other groups though Homoians uh, oppose the work of, use of the word substance because it's not in the Bible. Uh, so, uh, also, of course, this is uh, Council of Nicaea. Again, since the Christians are finally able to meet together without persecution, uh, it's one of the times when they're able to get together and discuss and figure out the, um, you know, what belongs belongs in the Bible, but not in a conspiratorial way. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about uh, the Da Vinci Code stuff. Uh, with Mary Magdalene and some other things. Um, and that's not, you know, the, one of the arguments there is, of course, that Nicaea, um, the Council of Nicaea is where, you know, the imperial hi hierarchy, you know, chooses what's in the Bible and throws out all this other stuff about, um, you know, and so it's just a, the church being oppressive. Um, but really it's not. It's, it's just the first chance that they're able to recognize what the churches are all following already. This, um, but in any case, so the word, word for substance isn't actually in the Bible, uh, and so some people oppose it. You know, same, it's kind of the same way you've got, there's some Christian groups uh, today, or groups that claim to be Christian today, that will just deny the, the fact that, deny the Trinity, because the, the word Trinity does not explicitly appear in the Bible. Um, and so, so you've got some people who are, who are like that. Uh, and then you've got the Anomians, uh, believe Christ is unlike the Father in his divinity, so he's, he's not even, not, not, not the same substance, not even similar substance, he's, he's totally different. Uh, but so then what they end up deciding is that the, they dis define the Trinity as having, their, that God has one substance, one ousia in three persons, hypostasis. Um, so and then so this this is what in, ends up getting decided in the, by the by the Council of uh, Nicaea, and so it ex succeeds in its purpose for the most part. Uh, then that they they among, among all the other things they come together and start at least what we know of today at least part of what we know of today is the Nicene Creed, defining who Jesus is, um, and trying to unite people, but. Um, its implementation was varied until the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD. Now, why is this? Why does this happen? Well, again, the problem is once you get Constantine and emperors playing, you know, invo being involved in religion, then um, how the emperor goes how the, is how the church goes. Uh, we, you know, we see this with, with state churches. Um, we see this with... Um, uh, with with, uh, with Germany, uh, you know, with Europe after after Luther, um, whatever the prince was, that's what the that state was in terms of Catholic, Lutheran, Reformed, whatever, and 
Uh, and then if the prince got married, or you know, if, if the ruler got married or changed religions, then that changed the whole change states. And so, um, so the emperors get involved in these theological doctrinal debates. Um, and the problem is they're not all good Orthodox Christians. In fact, there, there's debate. Um, Constantine was um, um, didn't get baptized until towards the end of his life, um, uh, which which was a an, at least not unusual practice. Um, and it wasn't denying the you know baptism of infants or anything. It was kind of the the idea that you wait <laughs> you waited until if you were an adult convert you waited until the last minute so that the all your sins got washed away by baptism, so you didn't wouldn't have time to commit as many more um, that would need to be, you know, you need to do penance for or something. Um, but the the problem is that Constantine is baptized then by an Arian bishop, um, and then over the next century or so, you uh, you know, fifty fifty years or so, you've got all these different emperors in control of different parts of the empire, uh, some of whom are Orthodox Christians, some of whom are Arian, some of whom don't care and allow themselves to get influenced by one bishop or another. Um, and then you've even got um, this guy named, uh, I forgot a slide for him, uh, Julian the Apostate, because he just denies being Christ Christian at all and even tries to start up persecutions again. Um, so, so there's a lot of ups and downs and things in that. So then the Council of Constantinople is called in 381 AD, which affirms Nicaea and follows the beliefs of three bishops from Cappadocia, who we call today the Cappadocian Fathers. Um, and so there are three bishops from Cappadocia, which is uh, modern day Eastern Turkey. Uh, if you Google Cappadocia, you actually get all these pictures of hot air balloons. Uh, this is apparently somewhat big tourist attraction stuff there. Uh, but the three Cappadocian fathers are uh, Basil the Great, uh, Gregory of Nizantius, um, and he, he's briefly the Archbishop of Constantinople, uh, and then Gregory of Nyssa, who's the brother of Basil. Um, and again, they're from Cappadocia. That's uh, here-ish, um, depending on which, <laughs> when, you, when you're looking at at Turkey, Cappadocia seems to move a little, move around a little bit, um, but it's kind of, that's about where where they are, um, and so they're, but they're they're brilliant the theologians. They work together, and they're able to get the council Council of Constantinople to adopt these both their their theolo theology, which is allows them to um, in the, in this division. All right, and so the, the, the theology of them, so each of the members of the Trinity is fully God. Uh, so God the Father is God, God the Son is God, God the Holy Spirit is God. Now, we didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit earlier, um, and that's really because the Holy Spirit isn't talked about a whole lot in Nicaea, except they put the Holy Spirit at the end, but that's the end of the creed. And we'll touch on that later. So in God, then this is uh, there's, again, summarized... Um, uh, so in God, there's one uzia, there's one substance, uh, one divine essence equally shared by each member of the Trinity, and three hypostates, the individual subsistence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So they're all the same stuff. There's And there's one substance, but there's three persons. So one God, three persons. Like a chain, the Trinity is relational. Discussion of one member of the Trinity always involves the other. Um... And so, and this is actually how we kind of still still deal with it. Um, trying to understand the Trinity, um, you know, continues to be a challenge. Uh, it's always a, hard to hard to talk about it uh, for conf in confirmation class. Also, partly because uh, education uh, philosophy uh, now tells us that middle school is the exact worst age to be talking about abstract concepts like the Trinity, um, but. But even if you're, you know, even once you get to, once I got to seminary, we spent a lot of time trying to understand all the all the details and things. And there's lots of theologians that try and and deal and argue with and, and understand all of the Trinity. And at least part of it is the fact that we can't fully understand the Trinity reminds us that it is uh, that God is God and bigger than us. Uh, but that one of the ways we understand the Trinity is that trying to under abstractly understand how the Trinity works doesn't 
it is is hard, hard, difficult, if not impossible, to do. Uh, but instead, if we look at the Trinity, especially in terms of what each person does, um, that that gives us a better, better way of understanding that they're all God, uh, but they're divided in different persons. Uh, yeah. All right. And so again, the original Nicene Creed just ended with, and in the Holy Spirit, uh, Council of Constantinople. Constantinople adds in most of what we use today. Um, they they cite verses like uh, John, from John 6. Uh, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. When John's, uh, when Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, in the Bread of Life chapter. Or elsewhere in the in his fare, farewell discourse. Um, you know, when he's in the upper room with his disciples, you know, he's saying, when the helper comes, that helper, uh, paraclete, uh, Holy Spirit, uh, comes who I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So again, Spirit comes from the Father, proceeds from the Father. So Holy Spirit's God too. Um, and then looking at Corinthians now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so again, citing these things, these ideas, that the Holy Spirit is still God. Um, and how Gregory of Nazantius is, is the one who kind of is able to get the un, get them to understand get the council to understand this, and he does so uh, in this excerpt. So uh, where he says the whole Old Testament proclaimed the Father openly and the Son more obscurely, the New Testament manifested the Son and suggested the deity deity of the Spirit. Now the Spirit himself dwells among us and supplies us with a clear demonstration of himself. So the people in the council were arguing, well, the Holy Spirit's not mentioned in the Old Testament, so can't be divine. Greg's, and Gregory's saying, well, no, the Old Testament focuses on God the Father. The New Testament focuses on God the, on Jesus, on God the Son. But the God the Son's alluded to in the Old Testament. And now, and then the New Testament points us to the Holy Spirit. And now we really see the Holy Spirit in action in these things. So... Or again, as we uh, heard in the gospel lesson for today, as we're celebrating Pentecost, uh, these th Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. All right. And so the Council of Constantinople, then, it's declared that the Holy Spirit is worshipped and should be worshipped and glorified in tandem with God the Father and God the Son. But of course, the problem is this: um, the issue of the Holy Spirit isn't as contentious then, uh, but will be the source of challenges later um, when we get, uh, especially when we get to the Great Schism uh, and the, the division between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and uh, the, this issue of the Holy Spirit and the Nicene Creed um, will become one of the one of the issues um, that divides that there. Um, all right, and so to so to end up, um, you know, again we're reminded uh, about old, good old Obi Wan. Um, you know, if you ask Jesus if he knows God, well, of course I know him. He's me. Uh, Jesus, the the councils uh, describe, define, um, point to the fact that Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God, and they are of the same substance but different persons from God the Father. Um, and, of course, that's what we still believe. Um, and so we thank all those involved in these councils uh, for that. And so we'll end then with the prayer of the day for those uh, Cappadocian fathers, for Basil the Great, Gregory, Gregory of Nazantius, and Gregory of Nyssa. Almighty God, you revealed to your church your eternal being of glorious majesty and perfect love as one God in a trinity of persons. May your church, with bishops like Basil of Caesarea, Gregory of Nazantius, and Gregory of Nyssa, receive grace to continue steadfast in the confession of the true faith and constant in our worship of you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much for watching.